All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Everyone Gets a Job, Episode 7. So the purpose of this whole series is to provide information to parents and to young people and to anybody who needs a job in the, the opportunities that are in the strongest economic sectors in Hamden, Connecticut, and in the region. So we've run a series of uh, panels on all different topics uh, going back to January, starting with healthcare, manufacturing, the trades, environmental science, and many others. Healthcare, I mentioned. So tonight we're going to be doing information technology. The idea here is to build economic prosperity in the town of Hamden. And by, doing, by providing an opportunity for all people to have good paying jobs, that's how you do it. Um, it's not just about the highest paying jobs, it's about good paying jobs that you can buy a house with and raise a family and become part of the Hamden Civic Infrastructure. So tonight we have an esteemed panel of uh, folks to talk about information technology. The, bio, the bios, the full bios are on your chair. Uh, there's, a, there's another uh, announcement that I'll talk about later at a break. We're going to do about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of presentation per speaker. And then we're going to take questions and answers and provide some time at the end for you to talk to uh, the individuals here if you want to ask individual questions. Some of them have materials and cards, and please feel free to talk to them afterwards. So the first speaker tonight uh, is um, a professor of computer science at Southern Connecticut State University, my alma mater. Winnie Yu is, uh, uh, as I said, a professor, and she's got a longer title that's in your bio, and I'm just going to turn the mic over to her to talk about computer science and what happens at Southern Connecticut State University. Okay, great. Is good? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Winnie Yu, and I have been working at Southern for, oh, a number of years <laughs> uh, as a full-time computer science faculty member. And for the last three years, I've also served as the uh, Director of Office of STEM Innovation and Leadership. Um, as a faculty member, my primary role is teaching in the classroom. Okay. As a Director of the STEM Office, uh, my primary uh, responsibility is to connect as a connector, okay, connecting among faculty members on campus to professional organizations as well as to the community. Um, so today I actually want to talk to you about two directions, if I may, okay, that, uh, in addition to information uh, technology. I want to actually talk to you about two areas that I feel are full of potential, okay, for particularly, uh, you know, our, our workforce, our young people thinking of a career. So the first one I want to talk about, okay, is actually bioscience particularly when it's coupled with analytics. Okay, and then I will also move into information technology. The national hotspots uh, for bioscience is actually in the San Francisco Bay Area, okay, as well as Boston. Now New Haven is actually second only to Boston on the East Coast. Okay. Um, there are many notable innovations in bioscience and medical science, okay, just to name a few. Uh, 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 that I'm sure you've seen you know, in your newspaper and magazines. Precision medicine, which is also known as personalized medicine. Okay, your immunotherapy, uh, which is, uh, addresses cancer treatment. And also many therapeutics and patient care. Okay, so to share some statistics with you. Okay, Connecticut is actually a very prominent bioscience research area. Do we know that Connecticut is actually the fifth highest NIH, National Institute of Health, funding, okay, in, in the nation, okay? And actually, New Haven is the fourth highest NIH funding per capita of any city, number four in the nation. So there are a lot of resources. And healthcare as an industry is actually one of the largest employer, okay, in the state of Connecticut. Okay, so that's actually a very good area to to explore, to get into, particularly when you combine that with data analytics, because we have more data than, than uh, you know, than, than <laughs> we can handle, okay, and we can learn a lot from it. So now let me shift focus and talk about technology. Technology, especially in data science, is a fast, um, global, globally growing, significant industry. So software engineering jobs are some of the highest paying jobs that we have in the country. 
So again, I'm just going to name some areas, and we can talk about more. Uh, you know, if if uh, if that is of interest to you. So some areas of explosive growth are AI, machine learning, data analytics, the Internet of Things, robotics, drones, and also quantum computing. Because Yale here, we have the Yale Quantum Institute right here, uh, you know, in town. Uh, and among these, okay, and I, I think we will hear about manufacturing in a little bit, okay, so you will, you will also hear that machine learning, Internet of Things, robotics, and all those are also very related to manufacturing, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a prominent component also in our state. So there are actually many opportunities in digital technology because the, the, uh, the path to excellence, okay, in, in information technology compared to bioscience is actually, uh, should I say, more attainable. <laughs> um, so to name a few, okay, I must mention, okay, Mark's Learn to Program TV. We have the Hoburton School, and for middle school and high school students, okay, the Elm City Innovation Collaborative, okay, the uh, program that um, I'm. I'm uh, I, I oversee and I'm very involved in, offer actually free coding um, workshops over the weekends uh, four to five times in a year, funded by Connecticut Innovations. Okay? And um, all these opportunities are offered to you to, to get involved. Um, now, to get active, there are also many opportunities in town. So such as downtown, we have the make it, you know, maker space or make haven. And also, you, you might have heard about the New Haven Free Public Library, also recently uh, received a very um, uh, prestigious award. They received one of the t they are one of the ten 2019 National Medal for Museum and Library Science. So they have a wonderful maker space area that you know I encourage you to go in there and uh, take advantage of their facility. Um, so uh, I you know I have. Um, other programs that I can talk to you if you're interested. So, for example, very recently I heard about the Tech Talent South, okay, and they are again uh, offering workshops that uh, also will connect the participants to companies. So, there's really uh, a, a time where there are lots of opportunities, and um, uh, maybe I'll pass it on maybe to the next speaker and perhaps Bill will. I just had one, oh, okay. One yes. question Could you explain what the Internet of Things is? Ah, okay. So if you um, think of Raspberry Pi, if you think of sensors, uh, so these days they are in many places. Okay, so sometimes when you walk into your house, all right, you could have your lights come on. Um, hello, Siri. Oh, I Please. Okay. <laughs> so, so there are, you know, Many personal assistants uh, that that uh, that's actually uh, in our everyday life. Okay, that can uh, be helpful. Okay, in, in in many ways. And how do they respond to to us? And how do they search data? How do they come up with response to your questions? How do they re you know respond to your requests? So those are uh, all huge areas of growth and um, room for perfection can I, well. can, I, can I add something to that? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Give me a microphone, let me stand up. All sorts of things could happen. Now, I, IoT is a great area. The reason that IoT is so interesting, I think, and, and Winnie hit on a lot of these areas, is that now we're adding internet and programming and coding to things that didn't have it before. A refrigerator used to plug it in, it was all mechanical. Now, it's run by computer programming. And you know, apropos to what we're talking about tonight, the internetization, IoT of all these devices is one of the things that's really growing the demand for developers in areas where you didn't see them before. Car manufacturing used to be strictly mechanical. And now every car company has large and very competitive software teams trying to bring you what's next in automotive technology. So IoT is the connection of all these devices, but I think what's important is how many jobs it's adding to the overall market, because now you need programmers for refrigerators, you need programmers for cars, you need programmers for devices that you never had any programming in before. So I think that's, that's really where the impact is. Sorry to jump in, it's just one of the areas I'm excited about. And he is excited, trust me. <laughs> 
Well, uh, you don't realize all the things in your life. We started about 10, 15 years ago with little robots that vacuum your floor, you know. And now you can uh, uh, look in your refrigerator from the middle of Stop and Shop and see if you have eggs in your refrigerator. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. The next speaker is Bill Villano, who's the director of the Workforce Alliance, which handles all kinds of workforce-related programs, uh, uh, job training dollars. We had Chris Reardon in an earlier session talk about manufacturing specifically. Bill's going to talk about some different topics in IT and what is going on in the region and, again, in career opportunities. Okay. He's a lot taller than me. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, every day uh, there's usually, you know, an article or a story on TV about uh, automation, artificial intelligence, robotics, and how all of this new technology is changing the way we work and the way we live. Um, initially, there had been kind of two schools of thought on this. One was that this was just the normal, you know, the changing in the economy, the changing in the jobs was just the normal churn in the economy. It happens all the time. Jobs get old, they go away, new jobs come take their place, people move on to that. The other kind of school of thought was more that, that this change is going faster than most of us can really keep up with and adjust to, and because of that, it's going to cause uh, really significant unemployment and a lot of dislocation for people and trouble getting back uh, uh, to, to jobs. And, and that, uh, so, so the whole idea, I guess, is, is that is it really different this time or is it not? And I, I kind of lean on, yes, it's different, maybe not gloom and doom, the end of the world, but uh, it is different. And, uh, you know, a couple of examples is, you know, as, as everyone is just saying, artificial intelligence is being used in a number of companies, a number of industries, organizations, government, you know, everything that we buy. Um, the increase in automation uh, is creating greater, <coughs> excuse me, greater efficiency, greater productivity, which means uh, fundamentally everybody is doing more with less because of the technology. Uh, we're seeing uh, more structural unemployment, and, and structural unemployment is the unemployment that's created because existing workers don't have the skills necessary to take on the new jobs that are coming. It's not, you know, like uh, we were talking earlier, where you can go from one manufacturing job to another. A lot of jobs are going away, and it's very difficult for some people to make that transition. And I think lastly, uh, it's, it's also not just affecting blue collar jobs. Most people talked about the new technology and if you worked in a factory that your jobs were at risk. Now it's, it's really being applied you know, to all jobs. So whether that's uh, healthcare or legal or accounting or finance, uh, you know, jobs that traditionally had required you know, an advanced degree, not so much anymore. Um, so I, I want to give you a few examples of, of what's happened already, just to kind of maybe put this in perspective. So right now, manufacturers are making twice as much product today as they did in the 1980s with 7 million fewer workers. So that's the automotive, you know, uh, General Motors, for example, uh, is making about the same amount of cars it made then with 40% fewer workers. More robotics there, I'll talk about that in a second. Right, the big data computing. Uh, you now, the the power of artificial intelligence is connecting with all of the data around the world, and uh, and it's it, you know the the numbers of outcomes. What happens with that is is just phenomenal. So, some examples. You know, you know, Google. Google now is connecting you to everything in the world. Uh, Watson. I don't know if some of you remember. Watson was the computer that went on Jeopardy and and beat the champions. Uh, and, and all kinds of applications, business applications for Watson, and monster.com, maybe some of you have used monster. That's, that's a way to connect to all job sources all around the country, all the data that's online, and to be able to bring you right now what's, what's the job that you want that's within 10 miles, 25 miles of where you live. Um, so, you know, everybody who's, who's talked about this subject um, refers to an Oxford University study that was in 2013 where, that said 47% of American jobs are, are automatable either totally or partially, right? And so I want to give you a few examples of like what's, 
you know, what's, what would that mean in some, some areas? So for example, we talked about autonomous cars, right? Self, you know, driverless cars. So that truck drivers, cab drivers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, of which there are 4.8 million of them in this country, you know, are at risk at some point of having their jobs go away. Um, but I think I should probably say, uh, and maybe I should have started with this, is that this is really all about when this is going to happen, right? Not if. Uh, uh, so uh, there was an interesting article I want to uh, just quote it to you from the New York Times a while ago. It said, autonomous vehicles that will outperform buses, cost less than Uber, and travel faster than cars stuck in traffic today are two years away, or 10, or 30. <laughs> and that's the real issue here, you know. The technology exists to have autonomous cars, but how far away are we from when a tractor trailer can leave Boston and get to San Francisco and make it and navigate it and, and, and deal with detours and traffic and, and being serviced and things like that? I mean, I think it's a while, a while away. Retail, we all know this. We see every day we see something in, in the paper about you know, Sears closing or other people closing a dress barn or something like that, which just announced uh, yesterday, there's 8 million uh, retail workers. There are 6% of the workforce. Amazon, by the way, the good news, which is moving right into North Haven and going to open up in a couple of, couple of months, uh, was um, uh, 18th on the uh, Fortune 500 list a few years ago. Now 12th, now they're 8th, you know, and it's not far to where, where they are. And then, we, again, we were talking about, you know, fast food, uh, you know, earlier. Uh, you know, you go in now and you're, you're going to start ordering on kiosks. There are some restaurants around the country where you, when you walk in, there's a tablet on your table and you, and you do it. So you, you get your food delivered to you, but not in the traditional uh, waiter sense. And uh, lastly, which I think is, is significant, again, talking about Amazon, is the warehousing and logistics business, right? It's big business. Amazon is going to hire in North Haven about 2,000 people initially, and, and maybe many more from there. Excuse me. Uh, Amazon has deployed 55,000 robots in their distribution warehouse. And right now, they're collaborative in the sense that th this bin follows a worker around. They pick your product. They pick what you've ordered, put it in the bin, bring it up, and it gets shipped away. Uh, but you know, where does that go? There's, there's a company called. Uh, fetch robotics and they basically make two robots one is called freight and the other is called fetch right <laughs> so freight is just what Amazon does it's a bin that follows the worker around and you put this and you, you put the product in and then it goes to get shipped fetch has arms <laughs> so now fetch not only can drive down the down the aisle with can go by itself pick your product and bring it to be shipped by humans for now, maybe, I don't know, I'm not really sure. Um, so, uh, so that's the good news, no, I'm only kidding. So, you know, <laughs> well, that sounds a little bit gloom and doom. I think where most people are leading is it in the short term, in the near term, what will happen in work uh, it, because of automation and robotics in the near term will be more to transform work than to replace it. Right. I mean, there clearly will be some positions. There clearly are some positions that are on the lower end. If, if you have a job that is, is somewhat unskilled, doesn't require a lot of education or certification, and is very repetitive, those are the jobs that are a danger. Those are the jobs that are easily automatable. Um, and so what's happening a lot is are these things called cobots. They're collaborative robots. And basically what the cobots, and, and the and a cobot could be something as simple as an arm, just an arm that moves around, or it could be something that's a little bit more human-like, or it could be some type of a vehicle, but they are made to, to assist humans in their work. Uh, a good example is there's a, a, a Ford company in Germany where there's a robot that helps the employee put in shock absorbers. So it holds the, you know, moves the car, it holds the thing in place, does those kind of things, so they're cheap, they're easily trainable, I mean, right now, you know, it, you could readily change a robot to pick something up and put it there. You do it a few times, it knows it, it can do it. What problem is, if the product changes or you want it to put it in a different place, you know, then that's, that's a whole other retraining. 
But the point is, is that they, they, assist, they assist humans, they, they uh, relieve some of the stress. Uh, what, that same robot in, in the German plant will lift steel and other kinds of things that normally would take three or four workers to do, now the machine does it. So it's basically all, all assistive. Um, there's a lot of concern about uh, people being displaced. Robot comes into a factory, the first thing everybody thinks my job is gone. Uh, I want to give you just two examples. There was a ladder manufacturer in Utah and uh, a forklift operator in Indiana that both bought this welding, the welding robots from a company and everybody thought their job was going to go away. But the increase in efficiency and the increase in productivity caused uh, uh, a tremendous growth in sales uh, and the companies expanded dramatically. So, you know, that's, that's the positive side of this. Um, so, uh, Dale asked me to talk a little bit just about uh, jobs, you know, what kind of jobs are there. So, I have a couple of handouts here that you can take after, take out, take after but fundamentally of the 11 uh, manufacturing occupations the Department of Labor is um, tracking, their projections, which were from 2016 to 2026, is all of them, with the exception of computer, program, computer programmers, which has a slight decrease, are, gonna, are going to increase, and, and increase fairly dramatically. With, uh, uh, Mark was just talking about software developers. That leads the list with about a 30% growth rate projected over the next uh, eight years or so. There's also another category, which is called mathematical sciences, and those are like actuaries and statisticians and research analysts, and those are growing uh, even more. And uh, my one little pitch here uh, is in my organization, uh, we have a program that's designed uh, for 17 to 29 year olds. It's a federal program, I'm not sure how they came up with that age range, but uh, it's designed specifically to train people in IT occupations. Uh, so people can go and get skill training, they can get on the job training, they can get internships, or, or all of those. So let me just say, in, in closing, um, it seems to me that what all of this is about is not necessarily about the change, but more about the pace of change. Are we gonna be able to keep up with this pace of change, and are we gonna be able to skill up to be able to, to make the transition? So, as I said earlier, it's not about if, these changes are happening, it's about when, it's about to what degree, and it's about what occupations, right? Demand for individuals will rise to the degree which you can complement the new technology and keep pace with that, and demand will fall if you're in a routine job and you're not doing lifelong learning or keeping up with it. So how do you prepare? Lifelong learning, continue, you know, your certificate is not enough, your degree is not enough, uh, you need 21st century skills, you need to be tech savvy, you need to be able to work in teams, you need to be able to communicate with people, um, and you have to continue to work, right? So, so, you know, a lot of companies will send you to school, school uh, or offer tuition reimbursement programs, learn on the job, learn at your community college, preferably do both. And I think there was one quote that I just want to end with, which uh, in one of the things I read that says, Complacency is the biggest threat to your paycheck. That's quite a quote. <laughs> One fi uh, interesting thing you said that you put government and artificial intelligence in the same sentence. <laughs> there was a joke in there. I'm trying to figure out what it is. <laughs> I have a response to that if you want it. Um, oh. The scary thing if you want to talk about government and intelligence is uh, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, when this came up, said, Job loss due to technology, quote, is not even on our radar, unquote. And we are thinking it's, it's again, quote, 50 to 100 years away. That's scary. <laughs> wow. So as uh, all these presentations go by, I, I, a lot of things pop in my head. My father was a cab driver, so when I think about Uber and Lyft and, you know, he wouldn't be pleased uh, on that end, but he'd probably become an Uber driver. He probably would have done that. He worked about 100 hours a week. I also thought about the number of hours that people will be working 20 years from now. Will it be 40, 50, or will it be a smarter 30? 
uh, it'll be going down even more, according to Marx. Uh, uh, and what's going to happen to labor unions if we have automation? There's a lot of things that really pop into my head um, that are going to become germane in the workforce. So our next speaker uh, is a good friend and has had many, many uh, uh, products that he's worked on and offered to the public. I believe he's trained a million people, and that is not an exaggeration. Um, in all these panels, we try to have at least one business on uh, each panel. Uh, Mark's going to talk about a number of things in IT, including his own business and where careers are going uh, on the street uh, in real time. Mark? Thanks, Dale. I always remind someone when they invite me to speak, you wanted this. Um, you know, listening to, to Bob and Winnie, I'm reminded of, of a Chinese curse. I think it goes something like, you should live in interesting times, which Robert Kennedy quoted famously in a speech. And what that meant is, you know, times that are turbulent with a lot of change can be scary, but there's lots of opportunity. And I, I think we're living through one of those times now. Um, I'm guessing that uh, some of these gentlemen in the room are, are school age, yes? You guys in school? So you've studied the Industrial Revolution? Does that sound familiar, Industrial Revolution? 1870s. <laughs> what happened during the Industrial Revolution, roughly? Anyone can answer. Yep, trains and railroads were created. Lots of change in society. And the biggest change that was impacted by the Industrial Revolution was the way people worked. Primarily before the Industrial Revolution, what did people do? Anybody know? Farmed. They were farmers, right? People did subsistence type jobs, things they needed to do to survive. They farmed, they hunted, and there wasn't, maybe there was a store in town that was earned by a merchant, but primarily people's jobs were to survive, and that involved farming and perhaps selling some of their, some of what they grew. I think we're going through a comparable change now because everything that is happening, the confluence of that is a revolution that is going to change the way people work. And IoT and the other thing, who's got one of these with them? I'm going to guess everybody. Right? The fact that you're walking around now with almost every piece of information that is known to man on the internet that you can look up in an instance has changed things. And the speed at which change is occurring is accelerating. My grandmother is 99 years old. She saw in 99 years the invention of everything from commercial aviation to the computer to the nuclear missile in 100 years. By the time she's 200, I expect that a lot more has changed. And she's going to live that long to make me miserable. Um, but in her lifetime, there's been a heck of a lot of change. But if you look at the difference between, and you say roughly from 1900 to 2000, you look at the changes between 1700 and 1800 and 1600 to 1700, the change was much slower. This rate of change is blinding in, compared to the rest of human history at this point, which is why you guys, anybody, and I'm talking to kind of the younger people in the room, need to be prepared for a different type of workforce than Dale was prepared for, than I was prepared for, than any of the adults in the room were prepared for. When I was, I'm 45 now, when I was growing up here in Connecticut, um, I grew up in, in Trumbull and Westport. You know, the, it was to, you know, you wanted to get a good education so you could have a good career in something specific. I chose computer science. And I did well with it. But now, half the jobs that people have prepared for are gone. I know people who prepared for jobs, for example, in radio. Well, radio, as we know, it's pretty much gone away. You know, and there's dozens of other examples. So what my job is, is I teach, and I teach people digital skills. So digital skills includes the gamut of web development, mobile development, other types of programming, and digital design. And all those areas are becoming increasingly important right now because of the digitization and all of the changes that we talked about already today, and all the changes that Bob mentioned, that Winnie mentioned, all are 
increasing the need for people who understand not how to consume technology, but how to create it. And that's the big difference, I think, and I think where there's a misunderstanding today in what people will need to be prepared for future careers. Um, anybody, anybody seen a little kid try and use an iPad? Anybody seen like have that experience? Like someone four, five, or six? Do you have to show them how to use it? Why is that? It's, I, I think you're right. I think part of it is that the interface is so good that it's natural to them. And becoming a consumer of technology more and more is going to be natural. Kids growing up today are going to be able to look at the technology and use it, whereas adults sometimes we have to struggle with the new technology. And I know I have that experience when I have younger people working with me at my company. They operate their Windows machine, their phone, much faster than I do, much more intuitively, and I have to think about it. But the advantage I have over them is I know how to create that. And that's where you can advantage yourself is by becoming a creator of technology, not just a consumer of it. And that's where the fields I just mentioned come in. Web development, mobile development, digital design and coding. All of those fields offer huge opportunities for people who want to create technology. And what's interesting is, you know, throughout the ecosystem of work, from large corporations to government and nonprofits to small companies to people who are self-employed, there are opportunities for people who can create technology. And sometimes people who create technology, I talked about people who can code. Any coders here? Winnie can code. <laughs> Nobody else? Tried it? Interested in it? Maybe? Maybe? The language that's used to create technology, in part, is code. And the other part of that language is designing user experiences. And there's huge amounts of jobs on both sides. I mentioned to Bob before we were starting here, when we were talking casually, the unemployment rate for digital designers is less than 2%. Bill, thank you. You could have just corrected me. There's like, it's not like, not like I, get, I don't get embarrassed. I'm sorry, I apologize, Bill. Um, the, the worst part is, here's his card right in front of me. It's, 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 it's a reading comprehension problem. What Bill and I were talking about, and Winnie were talking about a little bit, was, now I forgot, I don't, I, I'm off track. What were we talking about? Co Oh, the, the unemployment rate for digital designers is less than 2%. And that is, people talk about coding and learn to code and all that as you know, the most important thing you can do. But for everybody who's coding, there's someone who's got to design that interface so that four-year-old can use it intuitively. And so adults can figure it out. So there's a parallel track in creating technologies and creating the code, but also creating the interface that people use. So not only is there an explosion in coding jobs, but an explosion in design jobs. So if you're one of those people who just isn't going to learn to code, and I know some of you are out there, even though I bet I could teach you, um, there are opportunities for you in this segment of IT and development. Now, of course, there's also segments in cybersecurity. There's segments, and I think you did a separate panel on cybersecurity, right? We could do one. You could, could do one. Okay, sure. Make it nine. Um, you know, that are offshoots of this. But you know, if you want to learn either the design side or the coding side, there's huge opportunities for you. Uh, software developers as a general fields are third in earnings for all professions. Top one, anybody guess? What do you think the top earning f profession? That, there are three. We have two ahead of us. Physician, an attorney. So physician requires, I don't know how many years of school. It's four years undergraduate, four years medical school, Residency, fellowship. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I have friends who are my age who are only now like starting to get into private practice who became physicians. 
and they're going to make a lot of money, but they look at me like, boy, I wish I became a software developer, because I've been making money since I was 22. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, but it's, it's a highly paid pr profession. I think the, the only issue is here in Connecticut, the pay is average in a high cost of living state, but that's starting to improve. There was a study done by CITI, which is part of UConn Stanford, uh, the Information Technology Institute, the Connecticut Information Technology Institute that looked at salaries at IT in Connecticut. And they're a little bit depressed, but also coming up, which is good. But so if you want to get into IT, where do you start? So the first thing is that people look at what we do or what I do as a coder or developer as a monolith, as if it's all one thing, and it's not. You can learn different types of development regardless. You don't have to be a math whiz. You don't have to be hugely, hugely intelligent. You got I mean, to put in the work and, and you got to you know, know your basics, but you don't have to be above average in smarts. You don't have to be a mathematical wizard. But you got to be willing to put in, put in the, putting in the time. Now, for some people, if you want to do deep coding, if you want to do artificial intelligence, if you want to learn robotics, if you want to learn um, serious data analysis, then you need to see Winnie and you need to go to college and get a degree. There are some things that a degree is going to be irreplaceable. But if you're interested in designing websites, if you're interested in putting basic mobile applications together, if you're interested in creating advertisements for companies or creating games on Facebook, the reality is that a lot of successful developers either are self-taught or learned informally through programs like I have online. Um, so there are opportunities regardless of your educational background. Now, you know, computer science, like I said, is not all one thing. So one of the things that you can do if you're going to develop your skills without going to college is to get certifications. Certifications represent that you've learned a certain amount of things, that um, you've achieved a certain level of competence, and employers love them. I think the, the statistic, the statist, I can never say the word, statistic, statistic I saw was that uh, 75% of HR professionals in IT said certifications are important or very important. And they can actually, for some jobs, substitute for a degree and so can experience. You know, it's, it's really interesting because some of the most brilliant developers that I know have no degree at all and are self-taught. But you know, programs like mine really do give you the opportunity. We give people the opportunity to learn without going to college. My program, really, most of our people that we work with online are adults who have been displaced in the workforce. So a typical example is someone who just got out of the military and found out that the training he or she got in the military isn't so useful in the civilian world. It's a pretty common problem. So they'll come through our program, they'll learn basic web design development. So we'll take them through learning HTML, JavaScript, CSS, all of which are languages that are used to put together websites. So I think I'm probably getting close on my amount of time, it's a lot of for me. I do have up here, if, you, if you're interested, um, I have my cards and we do offer, if you're interested in trying it out, you can get your first certification online for free in, in HTML. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, you can take my card and shoot me an email or we can talk more about it here. And uh, you know, if there's questions, I'm gonna stick around. That's my time. Beautiful. Well, a lot of information to digest. What do you think? I got a little affect there. Their heads bobbed a little bit. Um, time for questions and answers. We have to be out of the room about 10 of 8, so we have a little time for questions and answers and for you to talk to the what speakers. If we stay? They shut the lights off. Oh. Not a lot. <laughs> I go home and eat dinner, and then I start working on my project later on. No Netflix for me tonight. Anyway, so you must have some questions, comments. Your daughter took one of Mark's classes. Do you have any? Uh, Her background will be in, uh, 
on that background, what she's going to be doing for the summer is cybersecurity. So, right. Uh, she wasn't really sure what, if she was interested in it, but I kind of pushed her because she had been in, in the situation where she had graduated from college with a psych degree. She couldn't find a job, and I kind of like learned it, about it, about Mark's program, got her involved in that. She got certified in, cert, in the HTML and CSS, and then she said, you know what, I really like this. I want to go a little bit deeper. Yeah, so the next, you know, once we get done with this panel series, sort of the next generation of what we're going to do, this was just the beginning. I think I've, you've heard me say this at all the panels. So we're going to build a web page and a web presence to drill down deeper into a topic. So you mentioned cybersecurity. We could, we could get involved with the military, have the military, and do something specific that's more drilled down into one of, any one of these topics. So we'll be looking at all the videos and all the content that we've established. We've, we've covered seven major areas tonight. Um, uh, I have a couple questions for the panelists, but uh, we will be having our final uh, of the series on June the 6th on job readiness. Okay, so we have uh, speakers from Gateway and uh, Southern uh, and from other places, uh, somebody to talk about leadership uh, and you know how to prepare young people for interviews and things like that. That'll be June the 6th at the Miller Senior Center in the small room off to the side. So uh, I have a couple questions. Do you, you have any questions? Yes, thank you. I, I think probably Bill is, is equipped to answer this too, and probably maybe better than I am. In my experience, you know, again, because it's not, you know, when people look at computer programming jobs, a lot of times they're looking at the top end, software engineer. There are jobs coding HTML, designing websites. They pay less than what an engineer would make. But what we're seeing people get hired at is anywhere from $25 to $35 an hour to start. So for a young person, you know, yeah, that's 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 pretty good pay. I, I don't know if you you know on twenty five dollars an hour if you want to raise a family in Connecticut on that, but as a starting wage. But also, you know, the thing about this field is as people get more experience, this is a great question. They learn more skills and they become more qualified for more senior positions. Experience is really really valued, I think, in in, in ways that it's not in some other jobs. So. No, because your experience is going to come at the job. You know, once you start, once you get your foot in the door, you're really you're going to be presented with problems that you don't know how to solve, and you have to really spend time. I think it was mentioned here about as far as like keeping up and teaching yourself. IT, computer science, is not a field you want to get into unless you really enjoy lifelong and le lifelong learning because it's going to change. In the 25 years I've been in the field, you know, we went from coding in languages like C and C++ to languages that are completely different, like HTML and JavaScript. And I didn't go back to school to learn those. But what's important is at the beginning, you get some good foundation. So you have a context to be able to keep learning. And it gets easier because kind of like, use a word processor at all? Do you use any computer programs? What do you use? Do you email? Okay, so so if you if you email and what do you use Gmail or? Okay, so if you use Gmail, do you think you could figure out Yahoo Mail? It's kind of like that, right? Once you've done one type of programming, it's different, but it's the same, and your experience helps you learn. You know, continue to learn. Okay. Did you want to say that? Well, I, I, I must say that I agree with Bob wholeheartedly. Mark. Um, we're, all, we're, we're, we're all Bob today. Three Bobs. It's not about the language, because every three to five years, you will see a, a new paradigm even. Okay, so it's about problem solving. Um, and you acquire experience and problem solving. And it's about innovative um, seeking solutions. Mm -hmm. 
support themselves and connect with Amazon on their own. So, so I also agree with Bob that as a, as a starting salary, okay, that, that is quite adequate, quite wonderful for, you know, for youngsters who started at those numbers. Uh, but bear in mind that the few change very, very rapidly. Imagine me in the classroom, okay? So the paradigm changes every three, five years. So what phases, uh, you know, an instructor, a professor, is sometimes you have to teach a course three, four times in order to perfect it and I get it to a point where I can anticipate questions from my class. That's great, but it's time to change. So that's the name of the game, and uh, you know one has to embrace that, okay? And and you know I would even go as far and say that kind of lifelong learning, the pace of the learning may not be for everyone, okay? But that's the pace of the technology field. Yeah. So I agree with Bob also that uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both Bobs. Um, it's tough for anybody to live on an entry-level salary, but the entry-level salaries for the, and I have some material here that you could take when you leave, and looking at the average entry-level salary in IT, it's about $22 an hour. The lowest is around 17, and the highest is, in the, is, is around $30 an hour. There's one that's at 42, uh, which is a network architect. So, and I mean, I think that's true in manufacturing also. You know, uh, we do a lot of manufacturing training, and Entry level wage for or people are in the sixteen dollars to eighteen dollar an hour, but in about five years, a manufacturer in Connecticut, you'll be earning eighty eighty five thousand dollars a year. So you know that's you have to take into account that there there is an entry level period that people are going to have to go through. But they're uh, in both IT and, and manufacturing right now in Connecticut, we're on a very good track. I mean, Connecticut is a big defense state. You know we have electric boat that builds subs. We have Pratt and Whitney engines and Sikorsky. Uh, electric boat has 500, 551 exactly suppliers in the state. Uh, Pratt has about a thousand. Pratt's eight thousand engines behind. Uh, electric boat has enough work. If they never got another contract till 2034, there's not a lot of place you can go and say I got a guaranteed job for 20 years. Um, so, uh, you know, and again, it's it's what we've all been singing. It's the same thing: lifelong learning. I mean, you know that you know that getting that initial credential is good, but you need to learn on the job and you need to continue to upgrade your skills. That's you guys right there. <laughs> you want to add in? I, I was just thinking, you know, a, an area closely allied that's also growing in Connecticut is digital media, um, especially if you get down closer to, to New York City in the, in the Norwalk Stanford corridor. We have a number of digital media companies. WWE is there, NBC Sports is there, um, and they've made long-term commitments to Connecticut. And it's a similar field in that, you know, you have to keep up the skills or software is always changing. Um, and But it's part of, you know, their platforms are changing to be more technology oriented. You know, WWE is trying to deliver everything to individual subscriptions on devices instead of, you know, USA Network or wherever you consumed, you know, their content before. So those changes are, are interesting, but as far as salaries and supporting, they're, they're often parallel because we keep losing people to NBC Sports who edit for me. You know, so if you want to work with computers but don't want to code and you want to do the creative side, which we also teach, the opportunities are parallel. They're starting at about $22 an hour right on uh, where, 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 Bill, where uh, Bill said. So I think, you know, it's... Is, is it Bob? <laughs> it's going to be Barney by the time we're doing Um so, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I think, you know, this is an area where there's some assurance that if somebody goes into it and, you know, you got to do the work up front to learn it, that there's going to be a satisfactory outcome as far as, you know, your kid not sleeping on a, your, you know, your couch when they're 25. Um, you know, and the other area, too, that, that, you know, I think appeals more to younger people that is starting to see some development here in Connecticut, which is at the cross-section of digital media and, and coding is game development. There's a couple of game development companies that have come. The Game Agency is one that came into Stanford recently that gives, has really interesting opportunities for younger people. And believe it or not, game developers are on the higher end of the pay scale when it comes to development because it's very difficult work, but it tends to be something that people really love to do. So if you have teenagers who are 
gamers, you know, which any people, any of you guys gamers? Um, only one? Okay, you kind of, really. not a gamer? You better love your love math. <laughs> But game development presents a lot of opportunity for everything from motion graphic artists to developers to testers, and all of those jobs pay very well, and those jobs are starting to appear here in Connecticut. So that's another area to kind of, I think that's more motivating to younger people, um, is, but still is an area where they can support themselves and, and gives them that technology exposure that's so important. It is, what's your name? Chris. Chris. It is, I think, one of the few industries that remains talent-based. Google recently eliminated their requirements for people to have a college degree, and many of the large technology companies are following suit. I, I happen to go the traditional route. I got an undergraduate and a master's in, in computer science. But when I started out in 1995, the gatekeeping required that I do that. No one would even look at my resume if I didn't have a degree. There is still a very important place for degrees. I don't want to minimize that. But it is absolutely possible for someone with informal training who does online schooling and is passionate about it and does projects on their own and develops a portfolio. And that's the key, is a portfolio of work that demonstrates your abilities um, to, to be employed in the gaming industry or any other sector of, of, of technology. It really is a talent-based industry. It happens to be still that most people go to college to develop that talent, but I think it's far from required. Uh, keep the mic for a second. This question, uh, it, it goes uh, to the issue of the certifications through your training mm -hmm. programs. How um, transferable, are they proprietary to anyone like Facebook, Google, or whatever? Or are they transferable to multiple industries? There's, there's two types of, of, of uh, certificates. We offer certificates in technologies like HTML, JavaScript that nobody owns, that are essentially open source technologies. And the idea of the certifications that we provide are to give people a level of proof that they've had this, what I call informal or casual education, and they've learned this skill. The way you earn a certificate from us and Someone in this room will be mad to hear this. Is you don't have to take an exam anymore, but you complete um, you complete a number of coding challenges because in the end, what matters is can you actually do it, not how well can you sit for an exam. And it's a lesson I've learned after a number of years. But that's one type of certificate, and the idea is to prove your your informal learning, to give you a transcript of your informal learning. The second type of certificate, I think what you're referring to is like a proprietary certificate that's offered by a company for a specific technology stack, like Microsoft or, help me. Or, or Cisco, or, um, he said Microsoft, Microsoft, Cisco. Uh, idle. All of these are specific proprietary that prepare you to do work on a specific technology. Both types of certificates are important, but they're not the same thing. So if you, you're like desperate, like I want to be a Microsoft engineer, there's a specific path for that. Or if I want to do networking, there's a specific path for that through certificates. The certificates that we offer are different in that they're trying to give you proof that you have a general body of knowledge that prepares you for a career or a job in web development, where there's not a specific technology firm that's kind of uh, owns the area. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, so you're basically two paths. Um, I have a question for Winnie regarding Southern's computer science program. Uh, the question really is about um, you know internships and other opportunities, job opportunities that come out of the experience of being in the program. Um, thank you. Uh, so we have two undergraduate programs. Uh, one in the general computing, uh, the more the traditional track, okay, and we also have a CIS, computer information system, that's a little bit more application-based. Um, internship is, uh, it's, it's highly encouraged. Uh, uh, some programs in the nation actually requires it. At Southern, it's not a required, you know, it's not a requirement for graduation. Um, you know, but uh, perhaps to comment on 
demand of, of the job market. You know, many of our students actually find uh, jobs, okay, and, and sometimes part-time, sometimes even full-time, actually before their graduation. So that is something that, uh, you know, when, when it, it depends on the student, okay, and if the student can handle that, I think it's a very good thing, because then it complements with their classroom learning. Um, so it's definitely something that, you know, we, we encourage. Uh, the reason I bring that up is to, to, to learn about it, but also uh, in the final panel that we'll be having on June 6th, we'll be talking specifically about internships, because that's one thing the parents really want to know. We're, like when I was in graduate school, uh, my professor said, just go to the city of New Haven, they'll give you an internship in the city plan office. And he was not correct. But I forced my way in, and I, I, I worked for Jim Farnham, actually, who, who you know. Uh, he was my boss, and David Holmes. I don't know if you knew him. Uh, they were, uh, I learned a lot, but I had to basically beg them to let, and they let me work there, and I, I, uh, my first job was as an intern making blueprints with the old-fashioned blueprint machines. I think I got brain damage from all the ammonia I had to put in there, but, but I learned a lot, and it was really, really important to build a resume that way. Any other questions before we break uh, for... Okay. I'll just talk. <laughs> yes. So I, I think I'm a big proponent of internships. I think you should take one at every opportunity. So we had an intern um, who was from Connecticut but went to Ithaca College. Um, this is actually Tim's son. And um, he interned with us for two summers. He did, he's a media guy. We do online courses, so we have video to edit. He did video editing and sound and worked in our studio and uh, did really well. And we didn't prepare him for a job, but his next internship did. He, uh, his next internship was with the Conan O'Brien show in Los Angeles. And that, show, that internship led to a job working in Hollywood on TV, which is, has been his lifelong dream. So I just think intern, and this is a kid from like nowhere, Connecticut, Essex, or some, some town. I, I think internships are, not that Essex is nowhere, just, you know, East of New Haven doesn't exist for some of us. Yeah. I, I have no stake in this. Um, but no, I, I think, like I said, internships, I can't recommend them enough in IT and technology because most interns, if they do well, do wind up getting hired by the firm where they internship. So. One last question from Ken, and then we're going to uh, take time for you to talk individually. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Um, the term Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, how do you see that? Is that something worth pursuing? The question was about uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Oh. <laughs> Who wants that? That's a winning question. <laughs> oh. Anybody want to handle this one? Uh. Oh. No, I mean, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's applications of technology. Um, you know, a good foundation in coding, however you get it, will prepare you to work in crypto or any of the developing areas. And this, this is one of those things I think where Winnie was talking before about the cyclical nature of the industry. Crypto and, and everything that's related to it, that's this four-year cycle. And I have a feeling that blockchain will become just part of the boring everyday field of computer science and we'll be on to something else. Um, it's kind of a shiny object right now, but it's the foundational work that you do however you do it and learn it that prepares you to work in, in, in what's coming next. Okay, so we're gonna end here um, and give you a chance to talk to the panelists individually. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for listening for those of you who will watch this eventually. Um, I've actually made a lot of notes tonight that are applicable, uh, little quotes that I got from all of you, and that uh, I, the whole concept of lifelong learning, which we all know is important, which was mentioned several times, is a topic I'm going to actually interject into the next panel. Uh, any field that you're in, it doesn't matter what field it is, uh, you're only going to, this is for the three of you, basically, most importantly. And, uh, and I try to tell this to my own kids. I have a 20 and a 23. I have the same concerns. The 27-year-old on the couch, I really, really worries me. I told them all, you're out. You're out. You're out. You've got to move out. But anyway, uh, they have to get health insurance. I think that's the big hang-up. But anyway, the lifelong learning thing is critical. I'm in economic development. 
I'm constantly reinventing what I'm doing in my office. I'm constantly going to conference. I'm constantly trying to uh, keep myself interested and relevant. Of course, keep myself paid as well. Uh, and that's the way you eventually make money. No matter what field you go into, you have to constantly be hungry to learn more because the world is changing so fast. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Rob, for the video. And spend some time with our panelists. We have about 10, 15 minutes before we have to be out. Thanks very much. Thanks,